you'll remember Dungeon of the Mad Mage. I did a singular video, maybe two, on it before. Mostly I did Waterdeep Dragon Heist content. But Dungeon of the Mad Mage is a, well, I believe still the only up to level 20 D&D uh, &D module that there is. Uh, it is 16, 17, I don't know, that, that amount of flaws of dungeon. Uh, each of them, I've kind of looked at the maps, some of them are smaller than others, but I think the largest has about 70 or 80 rooms. That's a fairly standard thing if you tell a, a you know, first edition player, that's all you did. You went in dungeons, and maybe you were also in the town, and you also did adventuring to get to the town, or to the dungeon. That was pretty much all there was. Mad Mage is entirely the dungeon. It was made as a addition to the Waterdeep Dragon Heist story once the uh, fifth level is achieved, once the heist has been done, a mysterious note invites the players to Undermountain where the rest of the bulk of their adventure will be if they choose to. Note how I said if they choose to, because Dragon Heist and Mad Mage work very well together. There are two cities in essence, Waterdeep on the top, under Mountain on the bottom. I have ran Dragon Heist, I have ran Mad Mage, I have played in Mad Mage as well, and I have played in Dragon Heist now that I think about it. I, I, I never think it's that good of an idea to uh, play in a module if you've already ran it, let alone played in it before, but it, it small group, you know, that kind of thing. And you'll notice, you know, there's two different campaign settings going on here. You have rooms and doors, and you've got uh, bigger rooms and more of them in a massive city. I'm doing a rough job of explaining this. Let's get on to my point. I have done the same thing in my campaign. I have two cities, Mystere up top, Arias um, on the bottom, and I'm making it all myself. I, I want to show you exactly what I'm working on. Uh, <laughs> let, let me take you, so, by the way, here's our landing page. Look at that, Secrets of Mystere. This has been going on for about 21 sessions now. Roll20 uh, is my preferred platform, as we're seeing here. I'm going to go into Aries. Floor 1. I have seven pages in here. Oh, look at all that. Man. I mean... Who, who has time to do all this? Uh, the answer is me. I have time to do all this. Uh, you'll notice there's about 20 to 30 rooms here. You know, there might be about 20 to 30 here. There might be about, you know, 20 to 30 here. And you think, wow, Jake, that's floor one. You've done seven floors. That's about 120, 130. Oh, you're planning a floor two? What's that layout like? Oh, you're doing 12. You're doing 12 sections. Uh, nobody do this. Nobody in their right mind should ever do this. Unless you are a person like me, who is in their room most of the time when they're not at work or in the gym, and when there's nothing better to do than to make a bunch of dungeon rooms. <laughs> Uh, I don't advise anyone do this, but I wanted to explain why I'm doing it. <laughs> so, something that Dragon Heist and Mad Mage do, which is fun, is that each complement each other. Dragon Heist poses a lot of enemies that are far too difficult for the players to contend with even once they've finished the campaign. There is Jarlaxle Bainray, a legendary rogue with legendary actions. There is Manshoon, a legendary wizard with legendary actions. There are the Castellanters, who are not legendary, unfortunately, but there's a lot of them, and they have a big mana. And then there's the Xanathar, who's a beholder, and I think that that speaks for itself. A level 5 party shouldn't be contending with that. Mad Mage solves that problem. It grants more opportunities for questing, therefore leveling up if you're doing the XP system, or similarly, each floor also counts as a level. That's the same as what I'm doing here. Now, what am I specifically using this mega dungeon for? So, I bloody love dungeons. That's the main reason. I 
as a player, I adore going through them. And as a dungeon master, there's nothing that gives me pleasure more than a player asking for a perception check. And it turns out there was a secret door there. Or similarly surprising them with an off-the-cuff dungeon encounter. Uh, I really enjoy that. But also, I'm running Mystere and Aries, my two cities in this campaign, as open world as I can possibly be. And what's more open than a million directions? Let's show you some of the possibilities of a mega dungeon. I'm going to take you to a random floor. Let's go to 1D. This is the least developed and the smallest. Notice how when they approach this area, they already have a lot of choices. Did they come from here? Or did they come from there? If so, do they go here, which leads, I haven't figured it out yet. Or do they go down here, which reveals, uh-oh, a Bodak boss fight. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of small things like that that you can toy around with. Freedom of choice, man. It's pretty awesome. So, more specifically, my kind of philosophy on a dungeon is that it is an absolute melting pot of everything that D&D is and can be. There's all sorts of weird stuff I've packed into here. Here's some ghouls having a snack. Here's some kobolds that have found a, an old war room and have decided they're going to play soldier with the hats. Here's a troll. He, if it is daytime, will uh, be asleep. And if he's woken up, we'll try and bargain instead, because trolls in my world have uh, a lethargy feature upon waking up. Or if it's the night, he's hungry and he wants to kill. There's more to this troll, however. If we take a look over here, I have put that there is a, a chimera corpse, and then here is where he poos. Uh, <laughs> these are the kind of fun discoveries I think players want to make, whether it be the undead secrets of the universe, the BBEG is here, or this is where the troll goes potty. It, all of it can be fun as hell, but how do you get someone down a dungeon? Let's scroll up a little bit on the side here. Look at this, I have a quests tab using my quest points system. I talked about that in my last video, I think. And in Aries here, we've got a few. Basilisk oil. Vistra Dark Moon, an allied alchemist, wants to go and see if they can find a basilisk. Go kill it and bring her back the basilisk so she can experiment on it. Boom. That is an immediate reason to go. Finding satire. They had a friend that went missing. He's down there somewhere. That's it. That's all they have. This is a great incentive for them to just go around the dungeon, ask, see what they can do, find leads. Let's have a look at uh, the hunt for Ehekatl, which is a strange name. Uh, a character that they've already met has a powerful ring that another character wants, uh, and they are helping him, and perhaps one day that will mean an exchange where our party member gets the ring. All of these are smaller incentives. There is no grand plot to be had in the... Uh, uh, the lower part of the city yet. I just want this to be a place that players can go if they want to go kill some shit, basically. The way I'm running Mystere, which is the higher level, the surface level, is very story-based, very role-play, and there isn't much of a fight going on up there at the moment. I kind of wanted to keep that theme, but this is Dungeons & Dragons. The character sheet is entirely made so that the characters can kill monsters, with a couple of exceptions, like finding items that could maybe help you kill a monster, or, you know, that kind of thing. So, Arias functions as a buffer, and then also functions as an, an absolute well pool for my creativity. There's a great Matt Colville video where it says to start with a dungeon, make a five page one, not five page, five room one, and see where you go from there. Uh, and I agree with this philosophy. Building a small dungeon is a great way to start a game. I think it's a lot more fun once you've got some chops behind you, once you've perhaps run a couple of pre-written dungeons or maybe done your first small one, make a, make a guy a little big. Make, make a little big guy, like, you know, this size. But not... <laughs> Not as big as I'm making it granted, but give them a lot to do. Something that helps with a mega dungeon is roaming monsters. If they're sleeping, sometimes they might be interrupted. Maybe this troll is going out for a snack. You don't have to write all this stuff down. It's just if you've got a monster in a room, 
that that that's good enough. You can move the monster out of the room to attack the party if you think it would make sense. Uh, I also to help out the party in terms of their you know tracking of the area. We go to floor one A here. Uh, I have been kind of revealing all of these room numbers, which help me with all my notes. So, for example, this room is partially ruined by crashes, as if a huge creature was slammed against the wall. Um, and you see they're going through it right now. I'm revealing numbers to them for note-taking. They have these maps as handouts that they have purchased from an NPC that they can use. And since I'm using Roll20, this is a digital platform, they can download this image, put it on a Word document or something, and then, boom, they can scribble all over it with whatever text otherwise. And similarly, if you're playing in real life, just, just do some drawings. And then if someone finds a map, give them the dungeon map. Boom. You'll notice, however, uh, if I take you back to here, yeah, we've got the image here. Uh, take, take a specific look at, where am I going? Here. Notice how if we look at where this is on the map here, oh, it's not there. I've made two versions, one with secret doors, one without. The secret doors one is for me, for them to find. <laughs> In fact, they're very much about to, if you look here, their trajectory is going this way. Uh, so, you're asking me, Jake, you're asking me, what was the point of any of this? I, I am more so being a general advocate for dungeons right now. That is the general idea of the video. There are a lot more incredible resources to go and look at, namely, like I mentioned earlier, Matt Colville. I think you should look at his philosophy for building a dungeon and simply take my general ideas of inspiration of how I formatted one and go from there. Matt Colville doesn't talk technical. He talks broad and he talks uh, almost philosophical about some concepts. I, I've just discussed some core basics and some of the ways that I run a dungeon. <laughs> Don't make... 12 areas of a single floor of a dungeon unless you know you have no life like I do, okay? <laughs> that's just that's just some advice uh, that I'm throwing your way. But regardless, I hope you have fun running a dungeon in one of your future games, whether it be in a module like Tomb of Annihilation, which has the best dungeon in any pre-written module of 5th edition. So check that out if you need some more inspiration. And uh, yeah, this mad rambling has finished. Ta-ra!